Welcome to the Dr. Osborne Zone. Tonight we're going to be talking about anxiety, pesticides, chocolate, and more failed catastrophic medical advice coming right up. You unlock this door with the key of compassion. Beyond it is another world, a world of science, a world of common sense, a world of sanity. You're moving into a land of both empathy and ethics, of nutritional knowledge and empowerment. You've just crossed over to Dr. Osborne's zone. That's a great question. I, you know, I like all kinds of music. I'm a big fan of classical, you know, the classics, Beethoven, Mozart. Um, but I'm also, from a modern day perspective, I think modern day classical is really progressive rock. Now, if you have anxiety and you're like at all like my wife, this is not music you want to listen to. It's very complex. There's uh, a lot of very, very fast drums and complex rhythms. It's not just like an easy tap your foot, sit down and listen to it. Uh, but if you're open for the suggestion and you're open for the challenge, I recommend you check out a couple different bands. Check out Dream Theater. Uh, you can check out another band called Terra Maze. There's another band that I really like. They only really have one album, but in my opinion, it's stellar. And it's a band called Ostura, O-S-T-U-R-A. So at your own risk, right? I warned you, if you have high anxiety and you don't like complex tunes, these are super complex, but really, really mind stimulating and uh, part of my faves. Hey, today's world anxiety is big on the list of people's problems. We've had two years of botched government intervention. We've had a lot of unknowns. We've had a lot of medical crises. We've had a lot of medical interventions that have also been botched. And people are frankly fed up and full of anxiety. So tonight I thought I'd bring to you five strategies that you can implement right now today to help you combat and move through this super anxious time in the world today. So let's dive in. So number one is free. Costs you nothing except time, uh, and that's exercise. So we look here at the diagram here, exercise. Why would we wanna exercise? Well, exercise increases endorphins and enkephalins. These chemicals can calm the mind down. Uh, one of my favorite examples of, of exercise reducing stress for individuals is if you ever watch the dog whisperer right now I know dog whisperer you're thinking Dr. Osborne you know we're not dogs right I get it um, but if you ever watch that show one of the common problems in dogs is anxiety and so what happens when these dogs have anxiety they tear up the house well, what happens when humans have anxiety they tear up their lives um, they may not, you know, like rip a hole in your shoe or, or tear a, a, a hole in the couch fabric, but they tear up their lives. And so what, what happens in the dog whisperer? What is the kind of common theme if you've ever watched this show? Is he puts the owner of the dog on roller skates and then they take that dog out and that dog can just pull them on the skates and, and get out its angst, get out its physical energy. Remember, anxiety is a manner of, of energy expression, right? It's you utilizing your energy in your, ladies especially, in your headspace instead of your physical body, right? So if we can take some of that energy and express it physically, there will be less energy for the headspace. There'll be less energy to basically to, to drive the anxiety of thought, right? And I guess I should say that this is an area where men it's, it's not 100% true, I'm generalizing here, but men typically have uh, more physical prowess, more ability to do more physical things, and they tend to struggle with anxiety less. And one of the reasons why is because men are so physical, whereas women are generally a lot less physical, and so that leaves for a lot of energy to expend here. And so women, in my experience, are thinkers, men are doers, and that means that women are going to think about something until it can be thought about no more, until they come up with some type of a resolution through that thought. Well, sometimes that gets the best of them, and that circle is very, very vicious. And that's where, you know, again, originally where anxiety 
can really start to manifest. So how do we how do we overcome that? We add physical activity to the day. Now, if you're new to exercise, if you haven't been doing exercise, obviously start with something reasonably easy. Don't start with uh, some back-breaking activities that uh, make you so sore you can't walk the day, next day, but start with what you're capable of that you're tolerant to. And so great thing to do if you're completely sedentary, start with 10,000 steps. What is that? That's basically that's five miles. If you're already here, right, then now start with some calisthenics. Jumping jacks, push-ups, squats, lunges, plank holds. Um, you know, body weight type of activity. Body weight's great because it, it doesn't overburden you. It doesn't uh, make you so sore that you can't function. Generally, most people can move about, them, move around their body without adding excessive heavy weights in the initial interim of trying to become more adept and more physical with exercise. But again, exercise is free. One of the most effective ways to calm down um, the, the, the combative mind. Now, remember, there's, a, there's another thing I want to talk about with, with, with this, and that has to do with, uh, ment uh, not mental illness, but with um, physical illness. So if somebody's sick, autoimmune disease, and they have a problem. So we'll call that physical illness autoimmune, right? One of the things that oftentimes happens is the frustration of being sick drives anxiety. So when somebody, usually what happens when somebody gets sick, is they get sick, they go to the doctor. That would generally be, again, for females, this is especially true, not so much for males. Males will let their arm fall off before they visit a doctor, but females, not so much. So physical illness sets in, you go to the doctor, you get you know, a prescription drug, to treat your symptoms, it doesn't really do anything, and so then you get frustration. And then frustration leads to, okay, why am I still sick? I'm doing what the doctor told me, and you know, maybe there's a couple of back and forths here. Maybe this happens a few times. Maybe you get the drug, doesn't work, you're still frustrated, you go back to the doctor, get another drug, doesn't work. Now, you're developing anxiety, not because you're an anxious person per se, but because your mind is trying to solve why you're sick. And so you're not really anxious. Your body is just putting your brain into a stimulation mode so that you can figure this out. In which case, we don't necessarily want to suppress that, right? We don't want to suppress healthy anxiety. We, what we want to suppress is anxiety that creates a feedback loop that never goes away. Um, at least temporarily until we resolve the problem. But if we can get past the point of frustration and anxiety and get to resolution, resolution stops the anxiety in its tracks. And so where most people are stuck is they can't get here. They can't find resolution because prescription drugs do not resolve uh, a problem. They, they only mask it for a time and then the body finds a workaround and then the problem continues to persist, thus driving the anxiety. So I will say this, um, you know, you can do all these things I'm gonna talk about tonight, but remember there is healthy anxiety too, and that's the anxiety that stimulates your mind to try to resolve or create a solution for the problem that you're experiencing. So don't forget that aspect of it either. Now if we look at, uh, at this study, you see effects of exercise and physical activity on anxiety. There's strong evidence from animal studies that exercise and regular activity positively impacts the pathophysiological processes of anxiety. Numerous studies and meta-analysis show that exercise is also associated with reduced anxiety in clinical settings. You see this all the time in sedentary individuals that do not exercise, they're always more anxious and that anxiety can drive illness as opposed to the illness driving the anxiety. And so this is where physical activity can really shine as a tool to use. So again, physical activity positively impacts a number of biological as well as physiological and psychological mechanisms to help reduce anxiety. So very, very important, again, that you take exercise seriously. We live in this society today where, where doctors say eat right and exercise, but don't care to elaborate on what any of that means. And so um, start with 
10,000 steps. If you tolerate that well, start with calisthenics. If you tolerate that well, move your way up to some resistance weight training. Like, continue to increase the bar as you feel better and better and better. Let's talk about number two in terms of anxiety tips, okay? And that is a hot Epsom salt bath. Again, this is a very low cost, very easy to implement um, therapy, if you will. Now, what is Epsom salt? Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate, MgSO4, uh, magnesium sulfate. And when you're in a bath where you're dumping Epsom salt in the bath, guess what? That magnesium in the Epsom salt can absorb through your skin. Your skin is an organ that absorbs magnesium as well. So some of the benefits of that hot magnesium uh, bath is that magnesium is a natural muscle relaxer, right? It takes away tension, it relaxes muscles. So especially if you're super tense in your shoulders and your neck area, that you remember all that tension in this area will cramp the, the fascia around the head, creating a pressure, right? Which can also drive anxiety and so you know, relaxing in a hot tub. I know it may sound a little a kind of elementary, but a lot of people forget this. This is super beneficial to do. So Epsom salt soaking. You can also do some aromatherapy in that Epsom salt. You know, one of the best uh, for relaxation is lavender. Lavender has a fantastic relaxation effect on the body overall. So again, the, in, you know, we also have, so we got the lavender, we got the magnesium. Then we also have therapeutic impact of the hot water, right? The hot bath itself. Um, what does that heat do? It increases blood flow. You increase that blood flow into your muscles. You open up the vessels and you allow more nutrients and oxygen and blood into those muscles and that allows for greater relaxation. So again, it's a relaxation effect. It's not a long-term solution permanently, but if you've had a long day, a long anxious day, magnesium, hot soaks with some lavender can be very, very effective. Now, what you don't wanna do before you jump in that hot bathtub is load up on caffeine, right? Because one of the things that can drive anxiety is caffeine. And so if we're talking about an Epsom salt bath, that's, that's a tool for relaxation. If we're talking about um, caffeine, uh, that's a tool for stimulation, right? So we don't, you know, you're, you're going to neutralize the effect. And a lot, I see this a lot because I see a lot of people do like matcha teas and other heavy caffeinated beverages um, consistently when they're anxious and they can't get anywhere with it. Um, remember that as caffeine is commonly consumed and our study showed that its intake was associated with depressive symptoms and higher levels of anxiety. And it doesn't mean you can never have caffeine. It doesn't mean that caffeine can't be part of your day with a cup of tea or even a cup of coffee, but if you're really struggling with anxiety, you might want to eliminate that from your diet for a time to see if that doesn't have a better impact for you. Okay, let's talk about number three here, which is certain types of, of nutrients. So nutrition is critical. Now there's two sides to the nutritional coin. You've got, you've got what are known as nutrients. And so nutrients help normalize biological processes. What does that mean? Um, that means, for example, in order for your body to be in a calm, relaxed state, in order for you to produce the neurochemicals that help your body relax and be calm, you need nutrients. And so, you know, an example would be magnesium and calcium. These are electrolytes that relax the muscle. Um, another example of that might be folate. Folate is necessary for your body to be able to make serotonin. And so again, these are nutrients. They're required by your body to regulate the processes of, of how you make neurotransmitters and of how your body is capable of getting into a relaxation mode. And so then you also have what we call green um, medicine. What does that mean? Green medicine is, okay, I'm super stressed, I need some relief right away, and I need to take something that has a potential medicinal benefit that's not working on helping regulate my normal biological processes, but it's more acting as either an inhibitor uh, or an aid to calming. And so this green medicine aspect would be things like GABA, what you see down here, gamma aminobutyric acid, whereas the multivitamin would fall in this category. 
GABA would fall in this category, L-theanine would fall in this category, passion flower would fall in that category. 5-HTP would actually fall in this category because 5-HTP is a precursor for serotonin. So you've got, again, nutrients that are necessary for the normal biological processes that can help regulate how your body perceives the environment. And then we have what are called green medicine agents that can be very, very helpful in the moment. Now, generally speaking, the green agents, these here, will work relatively quickly. They work fast, right? So they can work you know, usually within about 30 minutes. So if you need like some major relief right away, this is something that you could do. The theanine, the passion flower, the GABA, the valerian root, these are all, uh, again, these are all greens that will help with that process. And then think of magnesium, calcium, folate, zinc, and some of the other vitamins and minerals and amino acids more as things that, um, that you're gonna need on a regular day-to-day -day basis that will allow for the normalization of these processes. And so if you're, you know, for example, if you have an inflamed GI tract, and this is where a lot of people get in trouble. Their gut's inflamed, and so it's basically reducing their nutrient absorption, and so then they end up, over time, because of malnourishment, developing more and more symptoms of anxiety. So again, nutrition plays a major, major role. Don't forget uh, just how important nutrition can be. You know, Again, most completely ignore it. As a matter of fact, when we talk uh, a little bit later on about pharma harma, we talk about the catastrophic, in my opinion, catastrophic uh, misguidance and, and misconstruence of what actually causes anxiety and depression in science today. You know, the biggest blunder that was made is they completely ignored this right here, completely ignored it and told women and men who had anxiety and depression that they needed to be on chemicals for the rest of their life because they have this brain imbalance when in reality the imbalance comes from a lack of nutrients. And we look at nutrition as a metabolic treatment for anxiety. This is a great research study. Um, and I'm just gonna draw a little bit of attention to another nutrient and that is vitamin D, which is why I had this highlighted. Let's go to the screen here. So vitamin D insufficiency has been estimated at 77% in the United States, meaning almost 80% of people in the US have vitamin D deficiency. That's pretty epidemic in terms of quantity, how many people are low in vitamin D. Now vitamin D plays a major role in regulating hormones. It plays a major role in regulating absorption of calcium. And as we were talking about a minute ago, so in the brain, vitamin D regulates calcium homeostasis and ion channels, and every one of your nerve endings has a calcium channel in it, right? So calcium is very, very important for nerves to properly function, and if you don't have it, um, or you don't have enough of it, you can really create some disruption in neurotransmitter regulation. So you see neurotransmitter levels, including dopamine and serotonin, and secretion of nerve growth factor, and BDNF, uh, which is brain-derived neurotropic factor. The benefits of vitamin D are also mediated by its role in the shaping of the microbiome and reducing inflammation, so that gut and brain access inflammation. You see lower vitamin D are associated with multiple mental disorders, including schizophrenia, depression, and anxiety. Okay, one such association found that vitamin D levels in patients with a wide range of anxiety disorders were 60% of those of healthy controls. In interventional studies, vitamin D supplementation to those with vitamin D deficiency has been effective in addressing anxiety. Again, giving the vitamin D was actually clinically effective. In a study of 30 anxiety patients, once weekly vitamin D, okay, so right here, once weekly, uh, supplementation at 50,000 units. This is ironic because I remember when the New York Post accused me of recommending uh, lethal doses of vitamin D when that was my advice was to take 50,000 units of vitamin D. They claimed that that was a lethal. We had to threaten to sue them to get them to remove the article. Anyway, uh, supplementation at 50,000 units for three months significantly improved symptoms. A similar study in 51 women with type 2 diabetes also showed that 50,000 units of D uh, fortnightly and D decreased inflammation, reduced symptoms of anxiety over four months. So vitamin D in and of itself, research has shown that clinically, therapeutically, it can be very helpful at reducing anxiety. One of the reasons why is vitamin D is required for 
calcium absorption. Vitamin D tells your intestinal cells to increase their uptake of calcium. And so if we look here at this study on calcium, right? Ensuring adequate calcium intake may serve as a potential intervention for improving mental health given the biological functions of calcium in the nervous system, right? So calcium regulates neurotransmitters, okay? So the production of these chemicals that regulate how you think, okay? It regulates neuronal activation and mood regulation. Additionally, calcium is required to produce serotonin. Again, a key, key component that helps keep the mind calm, which is the precursor of melatonin, which guess what? What is melatonin? Melatonin is what makes you go to sleep at night, right? It's easy to become anxious when you're not sleeping deeply. It's easy to become more anxious when you're not getting good night's rest, right? Melatonin is important for regulating sleep cycles and sleep plays a fundamental role in maintaining emotional health. So again, this is not rocket science, folks. This is just biochemistry. And unfortunately, most doctors don't study it. They study pharma chemistry, right? Pharmacology, if you will. And so they wanna apply that uh, outdated, and in my opinion, esoteric model to the human health and it, and it doesn't work. Um, going on more, nutrition as a metabolic treatment for anxiety, you can see in this particular uh, research review uh, published in Frontiers in Psychiatry, um, this is what they're recommending, right? So consider taking more omega-3 and possibly taking curcumin or turmeric because of the anti-inflammatory effects. Consider vitamin D, which we just talked about, in a ketogenic diet. Well, we'll talk more in depth. I, I'd really say you don't need ketogenic so much as you need a grain-free diet, and we'll get into that in just a minute. Uh, and then avoid these things, right? So avoid sugar, avoid processed vegetable oils, terrible for your brain. Avoid artificial sweeteners, also stimulants in the brain. And I know we've all been told they're safe. That's a fake bill of goods. And then avoid gluten, which I was happy to see again that so um, why because when you do those things when you consider these and you avoid these you have a better control over inflammation and a better functioning microbiome look at the functions of these and how they relay into anxiety right so if you have for example too much omega-6 and not enough omega-3 you can drive inflammation that leads to anxiety. If you have immune cells that are attacking the things that you're eating, like the processed sugars and artificial sweeteners and oils, then again, you're gonna drive that anxiety process through inflammation. If you feed your body the wrong foods, i.e. gluten, you're gonna get a change in the microbiome itself leading to, remember a lot of the neurotransmitters are produced by the bacteria that live in your GI tract. As a matter of fact, some researchers show that as much as 90% of serotonin is produced in the brain or in the gut rather than in the brain. So it's in the gut itself, right? So gut playing a major, major role. Um, and, and some researchers are saying 60 to 70 percent of dopamine, which is also important in the regulation of anxiety, are produced in the gut. So, you know, this is all nutrition, right? And what's great, what I, I love to see it when researchers are actually doing their job, uh, again, because this was published in a major psychiatric medical journal, not in some like men's health article, not, no. no uh, no affront to men's health, but you know, there's scientific validity and research behind it is my point. And so it's something you can do and feel confident should be uh, effective. Let's talk about number four, which is um, evaluating relationships in your life. And one of the things that I have seen when nutrition fails, when diet change and exercise fails to help a person who's dealing or struggling with a lot of anxiety, a big reason why that is, is because they're in a toxic relationship and this could be you know a spouse it could be a boss or your job uh, it could be you know a friend I would just say how many of you this past two years thought you had really good friends and then because you maybe you didn't see eye to eye with your friend over COVID um, you, the friendship was became 
less than a friendship, right? There was there was actually uh, angst and anxiety that was created as a result of those differences that you couldn't see eye to eye on. And so it's, it's important that you look at these things, right? Because if you're not evaluating your relationships and asking how can, you know, how can I either improve them or how can I disconnect from them uh, because they're not, they're not serving anything other than to continue to make me ill and, and make me full of anxiety, um, you know, then your problem won't go away. Emotional uh, relationships are very, very critical, just as critical as nutrition. And so we also want to say find ways to disconnect from what we know are abusive, toxic relationships, and that's the relationship of, you know, social media. Don't spend your days and nights there being polarized. Um, TV, watching TV um, in the news, particularly, not so much TV as, as I would say the news for most. Um, news is usually negative and, by, and, and polarizing type of information. So again, the social media, the, the technology platforms, the news, all those what I would consider to be, for many people, toxic, and so avoid them uh, the best that you can and minimize your exposure to chemical abnormalities that are a consequence of that. Okay, let's talk about number five, which is avoiding grains, uh, caffeine, and food additives. Okay, so why grains? Many of you are familiar with my work, No Grain, No Pain, and in, in, in the book title, No Pain, is not necessarily limited to physical pain. It's also emotional pain, uh, or the pain of, of neurochemistry gone wrong, right? Grains for the vast majority of you are going to be highly inflammatory. And there are a number of reasons why. Not, and I no, notice I didn't just say gluten. Now, gluten definitely is a, is a neurotoxin, and it, it can create an autoimmune reaction against your brain and against your neurotransmitters. This has been measured uh, in a number of ways. But we also know that grains are highly inflammatory because they're high in omega-6 fats. We also know that some of the grains are contaminated with toxic metal. We know a lot of the grains contain uh, different types of heavy uh, mold toxins, so mycotoxins. We know that grains are a major source of carb toxicity, carbohydrate. This is why earlier, why that research study was mentioning the ketogenic diet as a temporary solution for carbohydrate toxicity. Excessive carbohydrates can drive this process. So these are just general properties of grain that if you're, you know, if you're like most Americans, 70% of your total calories come from wheat alone, right? And so you're really, really heavy on all these things. And so just cutting out grain Right, cuts out a lot of what can drive this process to a great degree. And we also know that caffeine, as I mentioned earlier, caffeine is a stimulant. And if you're dealing with high levels of anxiety, taking a stimulant is probably not a great idea. Even if it's not a permanent removal from your diet, taking that stimulant can create, um, can create an exacerbation of anxiety. So you've got to be, really play that cautiously. And I've had some people say, well, I don't drink coffee. They come see me and they're, and they're drinking like six cups of green tea a day because they're trying to get the, the antioxidants from the green tea. But they're still, with that quantity, they're still bringing in way too much caffeine that is driving that stimulation process. Another one that, you know, we'll talk more about this tonight too, is chocolate has caffeine in it. And, um, but it also has magnesium, right? And we talked that magnesium you know, an ounce of chocolate has about 60 grams of magnesium, which is a pretty nice little dose, but it's also got caffeine, um, you, know, any, you know, somewhere around 12, uh, 12 milligrams of, of uh, actually I said grams up here, I'm sorry, I'm I don't want to confuse anybody, this is milligrams, not grams, and then 12 milligrams of caffeine. So depending on the quantity of chocolate that you're consuming, you know, if you know one ounce, okay, that's fine. But if you're eating 10 ounces, you know, that's now 
equivalent to 120 milligrams of caffeine, which is also equivalent to a cup of coffee. And so if you're doing that, but you're also drinking a cup of coffee, and again, it's an additive effect. The more of it you take in, the more potential for creating a problem. So again, caffeine can be a major problem for some people. And then additives, a lot of your additives, particularly your dyes, like your, your FDNC, your food, drug, and cosmetic dyes. These are the dyes that commonly added to processed foods to give them color. Right, so anytime you see you know packaged processed food having super vivid colors, first thing you want to think of is dyes, and you would really want to get those out because a lot of these additives. This was actually research done by Dr. Feingold. I give that man credit because he was a pioneer in his time, but he did research on food additives, children, and ag uh, aggressive behavioral disorders. And so we know food additives can affect mood. We know artificial sweeteners as an additive can also impact and affect neurotransmission and mood. So got to be cautious of all of these things. So I want to dive a little bit deeper into gluten and anxiety. As you can see here in this study, again, published in Frontiers of Psychiatry, Gluten can induce inflammation by causing leaky gut. Gluten proteins increase zonulin expression, which increases gut permeability, AKA leaky gut. And zonulin is something you can have measured when you go to your doctor. Now this study goes on to say thereafter, immune stimulating compounds like LPS leak from the gut into the bloodstream, leading to inflammation. As many researchers are now identifying that anxiety is an inflammatory process. So if you're eating gluten, you're ripping holes in your gut lining, then bacterial byproducts called LPS leak into your bloodstream and can cause inflammation. Now, move down in this slide and you can see some additional things around gluten. So you see generalizing beyond celiac disease, zonulin has been linked as a biomarker of mental illness, such as autism, attention deficit disorder, and schizophrenia. Even in anxiety patients with no reported history of gastrointestinal disturbances, zonulin and LPS are found at elevated levels in the blood relative to non-anxious control subjects. This is consistent with the hypothesis that gluten can cause leaky gut to precipitate inflammation and anxiety and suggest patients with anxiety may be particularly sensitive to gluten. Folks, that's why I always say test, don't guess. Get genetically tested so that you know whether or not you absolutely need to remove gluten from your diet. So, so again, avoiding grains, caffeine, additives are gonna be your ally if you're really struggling with anxiety. So now let's go talk a little bit about chocolate because I know that's something on a lot of your minds. Hey, welcome, I've got some really Awesome chocolate bars we're gonna to review today. So these, all three of these are from the same brand, they're from Hue. And um, I decided to pick this brand, one, because it tastes pretty good. They're not paying me to say that, by the way. And two, um, the ingredients match what we wanna see in a chocolate bar. Now, let's not pull any punches here. Chocolate bars as a daily kind of snack, not a great idea. You don't, this isn't something you're gonna to wanna to do all the time, but there are gonna be times where you're craving chocolate. And so those times where you're craving chocolate and you don't wanna destroy your diet and eat a bunch of sugar and genetically modified soy, this is a great option. So we're gonna go first with the cashew butter variety of Hue chocolate. So it's got a nice thin layer, what I've assumed is some kind of cashew cream on the inside, don't know if you could see that from here, and then nice chocolate glaze on the outside. Pretty good. Reminds me a lot when I was a kid and I used to eat bad of uh, Reese's peanut butter cups. It has that kind of a texture, that kind of a flavor, really good, not too sweet, not killing your cheeks. Um, pretty good overall. Let's check out the raspberry flavor. Again, same thing here. Um, creamy texture on the inside and uh, chocolate glaze on the outside.
pretty good. Raspberry, very subtle hint of raspberry with chocolate overtones, but definitely, um, definitely my favorite of the, of the two so far. And then next we'll go to salty. For those of you who want the salty chocolate fix, it's actually a really good combination, salt and chocolate. Let's see what we got here. So no creamy layer this time, just chocolate. Here we go. It's good. It's just straight up chocolate. Nothing frilly, nothing fancy, but that salt, you can really taste it coming through. So there you have it. Three solid options for healthy chocolate that won't destroy your diet, won't destroy your health. Hopefully after this video, Hugh Chocolate is gonna send me a few free cases, but we'll see what happens. All right guys, hope you enjoyed it. In a deluge of medical catastrophic failures, I'm bringing you one more this week. We're now learning that the chemical theory of depression is actually not all it's cracked up to be. Check this out in this week's Pharma Harma. Hey, what do we got today? Today we're unveiling more misconception and fraud in science. Um, look, a recent major meta-analysis of the psychiatric literature on antidepressant medications has yet again found that what we've been told for decades about depression and anxiety being a chemical imbalance is not the full story. And so check this out, let's put this on the board. This was published in the journal Molecular Psychiatry. You can see here the serotonin theory of depression, a systematic umbrella review of the evidence. This review suggests that the huge research effort based on the serotonin hypothesis has not produced convincing evidence of a biochemical basis to depression. This is consistent with the research on many other biological markers. We suggest that it's time to acknowledge that the serotonin theory of depression is not empirically substantiated. Wow. So what have we been being told for the last many decades? That you know, anxiety and depression are chemical imbalances in your brain that require drug treatments that impact those chemicals. Such a simplified statement, right? As if, as if the level of your capacity for thought and behavior was regulated by something so simple as one medication. But that's really what every, every doctor has been pushing, every psychiatrist has been pushing despite the actual reality that those things aren't true. And this is what we call science-based medicine. So here we are, we've gotten the science-based medicine that was wrong again. Now, if we look at, I wanna put up a slide for you. This is a review study published in the journal Pharmaceutics. And so you can see your evidence of drug nutrient interactions with chronic use of commonly prescribed medications. And so in this research study, one of the medications being reviewed are the very same drugs that correct the chemical imbalance if you're dealing with anxiety and depression. And these drugs, there's a class of medicines called SSRIs. So check this out. Antidepressants, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So what this diagram is showing you is it's showing you the nutritional interactions with the drug. And so what we know about SSRIs is they deplete calcium and they deplete vitamin D. What we also know about them is they don't work very well unless you take folate, which is a B vitamin, it's vitamin B9 with them. So if you are folate deficient and take an SSRI, it won't really work very well. If you take folate with it, it'll work better. Does that mean that the drug itself requires folate for it to work? In which case, why not just take folate? But let's look at the deficiencies, the calcium and the vitamin D deficiencies. As I showed you earlier, calcium and vitamin D are, are major players in how our brains process neurological signals, right? So you need vitamin D to regulate how the different neurotransmitters communicate to each other. You need vitamin D to help regulate how much calcium you're capable of absorbing. Remember, all of your nerves have calcium channels at the end of them that regulate and modulate how neurotransmitters talk 
to the other cells, right, in your brain. We're talking about nerve-to-nerve -nerve communication, necessary, what do we need? We need calcium, we need vitamin D, the very drugs that have been pawned on the US as the solution for depression and anxiety also cause deficiencies of two of the very most important nutrients that your body needs to regulate thought and neurological processes. So beyond that, let's put that slide back up and you'll see also that people with low folate intake or that have the genetic MTHFR mutation also can do very, very poorly on these medications. So again, if you've got a history where you've been taking an SSRI for depression or anxiety, you should understand that it's blocking your vitamin D, it's blocking your calcium, it works better if you take folate, and if you have an MTHFR mutation, you really need to have your folate levels measured to make sure you're getting adequate quantities. So if you're on these medications, know the harm, know the nutritional side effects. If you intend on staying on them, get nutritionally checked out and demand better from your prescribing doctor. Hey, the world can be a crazy place. In this week's episode of Backwards, we're going to talk about pesticides being sold to you as food. Check this out. Hey, this week in U.S. news, what are we finding? We're finding that 80% of U.S. citizens have glyphosate in their urine. This comes from the U.S. National Nutrition Examination Survey, where they found the herbicide in 1,885 of the 2,310 urine samples that were representative of the U.S. population. So nearly a third of the samples came from children ages 6 to 18. And I quote, Glyphosate is the most widely used herbicide in the country, yet unto now we have very little data on exposure said Alex Timken, a toxicologist at the EWG. In a statement issued Monday, children in the U.S. are regularly exposed to this cancer-causing weed killer through the food they eat virtually every day. What a sad state of affairs. But let's dive in just a little bit deeper. Some research studies, I'll show that up here on the board, show the toxicity impacts of glyphosate. So again, if 80% of the people in the US have elevations of glyphosate coming out in their urine, and glyphosate can be a toxin to the nervous system. It can cause oxidative stress, neuroinflammation, it can disrupt development, it can cause neuronal death, behavioral impairment, neuropathology, which is basically diseases of the mind. That's right, glyphosate has been shown to do this in both humans and in animals. So why is our government allowing it to be present in our food? Why does our EPA and our FDA not regulate it more tightly or not have tighter controls on the access to this, to the use of this chemical toxin that is poisoning our populations to death? Well, check this out. Glyphosate, a non-selective systemic biocide with broad spectrum activity is the most widely used herbicide in the world. It can persist in the environment for days or months and as an intensive and large scale use can constitute a major environmental and health problem. Check out some of these numbers and statistics. Now this is a, a broad spectrum that's been in use since 1974. Now remember these dates, it's been in use since 1974. By the year 2007, more than 180 million pounds were used annually on commercial crops grown in the US. But as well, we had 8 million pounds being used in people's backyards for their own gardens. So this is a, a chemical pesticide that's got, had very little research, was railroaded through, its approval was railroaded through. The FDA and the EPA promised that they would regulate it and protect us from it. And that is just now coming to light that 80% of Americans tested positive or 80% of the sample tested positive for high levels of glyphosate. Now exposure to glyphosate or its commercial formulations induces several neurotoxic effects, again, on the board. It has been shown 
that exposure to this pesticide during the early stages of life can seriously affect normal cell development by deregulating some of the signaling pathways involved in the process leading to alterations in differentiation, neuronal growth, and myelinization. These are all processes that affect the nervous system. So glyphosate also seems to exert a significant toxic effect on neurotransmission and to induce oxidative stress, neuroinflammation, and mitochondrial dysfunction, processes that lead to neuronal death due to autophagy, necrosis, or apoptosis, as well as the appearance of behavioral and motor disorders. Bottom line, folks, this stuff is poison and it's killing the nervous systems of your children if you're feeding them GMO grown foods and non-organic foods. Now, let's go on to look at what we know historically about glyphosate. Since 1974, it's been in use. Now, by 2007, more than 180 million pounds of the stuff were sprayed on our commercial crops, and about 8 million pounds annually were sprayed in garden backyards. You know, American citizens pumping the stuff on their own fruits and vegetables, pumping it on their yards for weed control. So it's a, it's a heavily, heavily used pesticide with very, very little research. Now the EPA approved it. Again, we're going back to 1974, but check this out. This is from July 1st, 2010. This is directly from GovInfo, which is a website that, that holds the record of these things. So you can see here in Title 40 of the Protection of the Environment by the EPA in Chapter 1, Environmental Protection Agency, Subchapter E, Part 180, Subpart C, Section 180.364 is where you're going to find the information about glyphosate. And what that section says is this is the EPA establishes the allowable amounts of glyphosate for human consumption and exposure. And so you, if you go here, you, and we'll pull this slide up for you, you can see all the way from acerola all the way down to Yukon tubers, there is a limit that the EPA set up for the FDA to make sure that we were being protected and not overexposed to these chemicals. Now, how does our government protect us? Well, check this out. Look at this next slide. This is directly taken from the FDA's website. What is the FDA doing to monitor glyphosate residues in or on food? Now, remember, I just showed you a document that was published in 2010, and here we are today. This is 2016, 2017. Okay, and so you can see here in fiscal year 2016, the FDA developed a streamlined selective residue method for testing for glyphosate residues. So from 2016 to 2017, the FDA began preliminary testing of samples of soybeans, corn, milk, and eggs for glyphosate residue. So, so folks, in 2010, the EPA set up guidelines on allowable residues of glyphosate for many of our foods. But the FDA didn't even start testing for residues of glyphosate in food until fiscal year of 2016, 2017. Why didn't they develop uh, a methodology. Why didn't they test earlier? Again, coming directly from the FDA's website. The FDA is continuously expanding its monitoring capabilities to fulfill its obligation to ensure that pesticide residues on or in domestic and imported foods do not exceed EPA tolerances. Okay, EPA set tolerances 2010. They didn't start testing for these things until 2016. Why did they allow it to be approved in the first place? If they couldn't test for it, why even establish guidelines if they're not testing for it, but they're allowing it in our food, right? It makes zero sense that the EPA um, would establish a criteria for tolerance and the FDA wouldn't even measure it for almost a full decade. And now we have a study coming out saying that this compound, this toxic chemical is being found in 80% of Americans. So, I mean, the FDA, again, they have, they have failed us. Just one more way they have failed us. They've taken your tax dollars, they've taken my tax dollars, and they took seven years to develop a test to measure a chemical that they know has known toxic side effects that they passed anyway with no ability to regulate how much you were being exposed to, even though the EPA set those guideline, guidelines up back in 2010. So thanks a lot, FDA for all your hard work and for being so prompt. And now we're being told that we have toxic levels of these compounds in our bodies. 
you know, especially those of you who aren't choosing organic. So if you ever needed a reason to grow your own food or choose organic, I think I'm hopefully giving it to you today. And let's put up one more slide. And this was a, a review topic on glyphosate roundup and the failures of regulatory assessment as if, uh, as if what I just shared with you wasn't enough. This group of researchers goes on to say there are close ties between the regulators and the industry that they are supposed to regulate. Objectionable practices include revolving doors between the regulators and the industry, heavy reliance on unpublished papers produced by the industry itself while dismissing papers published by independent scientists and strong covert influence on the regulatory process by industry. Although this paper focuses on the European Union, the situation is much the same in the United States. So again, if you look at it from the perspective, glyphosate's been in use since 1974. We didn't have uh, safety data on it until 2010. We didn't start testing for levels in US citizens until 2016, 2017. And now we're being told that it's a problematic issue. And when we look at the damage that glyphosate can do, we, we see largely its impact and effect on the nervous system. And as we're talking about anxiety in tonight's show, it, 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 you know, I just wanted to bring this home. Demand better. Every single one of you watching this should be doing more to make sure that you're not getting exposure to this toxic compound. Either grow some of your own food buy organic, support your local co-ops and your local farmers. Because if you continue to put your faith and trust in the US government to regulate the powers that be for your safety, know that all you're gonna get is corruption and undue influence of the very industries that are supposed to be policed on the very agencies that are supposed to be policing them. Hey, thanks for spending your Tuesday evening with me on the Dr. Osborne Zone. Don't forget to join me live for questions and answers this Thursday. We're gonna be going live at 12.30 p.m. That's Central Standard Time. Make sure you sign up for our newsletter list if you wanna get that email reminder to your inbox.